All right. How many of you guys were not here for the part one session? Me. So, yeah. so if, about half. OK, cool. So I'll just um, do a quick recap on the part one session. And uh, you have your no, I don't. I don't. So you'll have to watch the video with the sunglasses. But so yesterday I talked about you know our perceptions and how we all you know, grow up and through experiences and through our upbringing and through you know um, just those uh, traits that we that we're brought up with you know in our habits and our rituals that we do, we all have these biases that we view the world through. And until we see things 100% the way Jesus does, all of us have these false perceptions that we think are real. And so I covered that yesterday. And I do want to uh, clarify on one thing, is yesterday, I, you know, with the glasses, I, I said, you know, I grew up Baptist, my parents were Baptist, my grandparents were Baptist. I want to clarify one thing on that. What I meant by that was, is the denomination or whatever relig religion we're brought up uh, in, you know, most of us just identify as that. And so my, my point with what, that comment was to just, have we ever questioned why we're, I identify as this denomination or that or whatever. So it wasn't just about a Baptist thing, it was just that denomination thing. So just want to clarify that. Um, and so with part one, what we got into was, you know, Genesis, you know, chapter one and how it made absolutely no sense. And when I got to the, the version that I had was the NRSV when it talks about the dome. So when I was up on that mountaintop in the beginning of the book, how it just made no sense to me. And that's really where the seed was planted for the book. So on page two of the book, when it says, in the beginning when God, oh, excuse me, on page four, when it says, and God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. I mean, that word dome just threw me for a loop because I kept, I had that image in those, that lens of the globe that, we're, that we all grew up with. And so I was trying to fit the glo globe with a dome and it just, it did not make sense. And so, so God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And you know, this makes absolutely no sense with what we're all brought up believing and what we're all brought up taught. So, you know, other versions, you know, say the expanse, um, say the vault, and say the firmament, and that's just the ones that are in the book. And so that's where the seed was planted for the book. Well, so on day two, you know, the uh, day two the, is the vault, you know, and the, the dome. Day three is when the land shows up. Um, and the uh, plants show up on page six. Um, so like I said, I'm just skipping through this because we covered this yesterday, but uh, page eight is when, uh, let's see, the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the firmament. And uh, one thing too, one side note, is when it says, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. Well, we're going to see here in just a little bit that like on page 31, it talks about when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Uh, so this is when, excuse me, verse six, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened or who, who laid the corners thereof, you know, talking about the earth and the foundations of the earth, you know, when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy about God, you know, making the foundations of the earth. But this is before uh, day four, you know, the earth shows up before the sun, moon, and stars are placed in. So when God says, um, and he made the stars also on page eight on day four, you know, I just wonder if the, the, the stars specifically were created prior to this, because it seems like just a nonchalant, oh, he made the stars also, not necessarily that exact day. Just a little side note. Um, but, uh, but they were certainly placed in the firmament on day four. Uh, day five, everything in the, in the waters, and then uh, the birds show up. Uh, day six, page 12, and uh, 14 is when uh, all, everything that's on the earth, uh, as far as the creepy crawly things, the beasts, and then man is the last thing to be created. 
and then day seven, God rests. So that's what we covered yesterday. And so part two, descriptions of earth and its surroundings. And so this part is about other stories that are uh, stories about creation, stories that fit into uh, the creation week, where it kind of expands on and gives a little bit more detail to Genesis chapter 1. So page 20. So I'll just read, I'll just read one version because um, I want to get through as much of this as possible. So I'll just read King James, uh, page 20. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggars from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. Um, and so if you look down in the definition where pillars is underlined, you know, a firm upright support for superstructure, you know, and if you look into construction, well, pillars and columns are all part of a foundation. And so I have a good friend who does concrete work. They're called pillars, they're called uh, columns, and they're all part of a foundation. And so, um, so that's, you know, it gives more uh, emphasis about what we're going to see here in the future as far as what is under the earth. And so there's that. And then so page 22. And actually also, why don't I take questions on the specific, if there's a question about a specific thing as we go, let's just go ahead and do that instead of waiting until the end. So, if, so uh, page 22, First Chronicles 16. Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Uh, NIV, it cannot be moved. ESV, it shall never be moved. And then First Chronicles, same thing, it firmly established, it shall never be moved uh, from the NRSV. And so it gives you a description that, okay, the previous page was, it's set on foundations or pillars, and it doesn't move. Um, so the, the globe model, absolutely, we have to somehow allegorize this to fit the globe model uh, if we want that to try to work. Um, and another thing also with this part, it goes through in the order that it's found through in the Bible. So from Genesis to Revelation. So in part one, or part, excuse me, part two, this is the order that it, this is found in your Bible as well. I originally wanted to do in chronological order, but I don't think there's any consensus on what book for sure was written before what book. So, uh, so page 24. Uh, so therefore, snares are around about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee, or darkness that thou canst not see, the abundance of waters covers thee. It is, is it not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. So you get the sense of height, up, down, right? And thou sayest, how doth, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Uh, is not God high in the heavens? You know, and that's where we go, you know, glory to God in the highest, you know, in that, that sense of height. And then you look at height, distance upward. You know, I mean, so it's, if we think about this in very, very basic terms of what is being described, you know, we see God above, um, and then in the NRSV, he walks on the dome of heaven. That's interesting. And when it says dome of heaven, well, also on page four, back when, it talk, when the firmament shows up on day two, you know, the firmament is called heaven. And so in a lot of places when it says heaven, we have to distinguish what heaven is it talking about. A lot of times it's, you know, the heaven right above us, it's the firmament, and it's also the highest heaven as well. Um, any questions on... This page, yeah. Is there any conversion that suggests what the height was anywhere? Oh, the actual measurement? There is. And it uh, that's coming up here when it says we cannot comprehend the heights of heaven. So yes, there's a description, but it's a, it's, it says we can't comprehend it. So it's not going to tell you, yeah. It's not going to tell you 20 miles above us, God is, you know, or, or not 20, but say 300 or whatever. You know, so, okay. yeah, good question, though. Yeah. Great question, yeah. So in the book, uh, I have that covered as well. So page 167, when it goes first, second, and third heaven, um, this is on, yeah, page 167. The, so 
you know, where, the, where the birds fly, you know, is referred to as the heavens. The sun, moon, and stars are referred to as the heavens and the highest heaven. So third heaven. So we know for sure that where God's heaven is, is the third heaven. Okay? I, think, I don't think we can argue about that. Now, the, the, the first and second, you know, this is one of those where the first heaven could just be the lower levels where the birds fly. Second heaven is much higher up where the sun, moon, and stars are and also where the principalities of the air. And so this is kind of one sense. The other sense could be everything inside would be the first heaven. The other one, considering on uh, page four on day two, the firmament was called heaven. So theoretically, that could also be the second heaven and the third heaven. Um, could certain, so I could see either way. When I, when I assembled this, this is what made the most sense to me since this, that's kind of the only issue that I've gone, hmm, well, I wonder if it's the first is everything inside and second is that, because I could, I could see either one. Um, we don't know how thick it is. We know it's a physical hard structure. We know that it has windows. We know God walks on it. We know it holds back water. We don't know how thick it is. We don't know how high it is. In my opinion, we'll never know in this lifetime. Those will never know. And so it's great people want to know that kind of stuff, you know, I, but I think we have to decide those are God questions. And if we knew all these answers, what do we need God for? You know, so that's where, you know, there's some things we will never know in this life. I think we will eventually, you know, after Jesus returns, I think he's going to explain a whole lot to us. But um, uh, it also, you know, uh, talks about the ferment reflecting the sun's heat. Um, there's other descriptions as well. So, uh, let's see. So, page 26. So, I'll read ESV, for instance. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. So, this here, this is one thing that, uh, that I'm glad that it's like God told me to fast from everyone else's work. So, at some point early on, I stopped looking into everyone else's work. And so just read the Bible, prayed a ton, and I had a concordance with me, and just really, just me and God and his word. And so there's a lot of places. So if you look at the image, you know, with the north, I, I have come to the conclusion that north is especially referring to, like, the very most center point. And it seems like specifically the highest point um, right below where God is. But it also is everything straight below that, I guess you could say, um, that most northern point. So the center point of the earth, but also there's so many places like God coming out of the north. There's examples of that. And so when it talks about um, the void, empty space, this also uh, explains. Um, so when every eye sees Jesus when he returns, well, how is that possible if not the whole earth can see the north star? Well, if the North Star is much lower than we think it is, and we don't understand the height of the firmament, so the North Star could be significantly lower than the bottom of the firmament, if that makes sense, which would create a void and a perspective that we just cannot see that distance between. And so, for instance, uh, this is towards the end. Is this a question people, a lot of you guys have too, as, as far as that goes? How can every eye see him? I think it's an interesting uh, problem. Yeah. And, yeah, and more specifically on page 220, 221, this is probably the best example of the empty place. So if you look, well, I don't want to fast forward to take too long, but if you guys look on page 221, oh, I'm sorry, if you guys don't have a copy, I got loaners right here. I'm, I'm loaning out, if, yeah. If, yeah, if, could you grab a few more for the other people here? I heard you can see the North Star, too, pretty well below the equator. Mm -hmm. like, so it's, it's almost even high enough to, okay. to reach that point. Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. And I think it's all due to perspective as far as we can only see airplanes fly away for so long. You know, we can only see things for so far until we go, you know, further out of distance. And so to me, you know, in Job 26 talking about the void is just from between the North Star or, you know, the stars in general to the bottom of the firmament is, you know, that void, that empty place where it will give us that perspective where we just don't see certain things. 
if that makes sense. And that also explains why every eye would be able to see him. So, questions on this at all? But my son in law says you can't see the North Star from the Southern Hemisphere. But I, like you said, it's just perspective. It, yeah, it's perspective. In the yeah. Hemisphere. Yeah, it's just, it's just absolutely perspective. You know, you can only see airplanes for so long, you can only see certain things for so long. Um, but if you were to be able to go up higher, you know, it should come in back into view. So, all right. So, did I cover everything on that? Um, okay, so also the descriptions on page 27. So the north is stretched over empty place. Earth is not hanging from anything. It is set on pillars. So this is one of the two verses people go to about, you know, oh, earth is uh, spinning, you know, and going through space. When it says earth is hanging, earth is not the earth. Okay, and earth, and let me read the whole verse. He stretches out north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. So earth is not hanging from anything because if you look at the previous pages, like on page 22 and page 20, yeah, absolutely. You know, because it, it's not hanging because it's sitting on pillars and not moving. Yeah, we got, we got loner books right here. Feel Sorry. free. Yeah, no, it's all good. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, and so... Keep going here. So verse 10, he has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. So there's two, there's two really important factors here. So the circle inscribed on the face, okay, and that face brings us back right back to day one, the face of the deep, right? Um, so we see there's a circle on the face. So just kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. And then the pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. So on uh, page four, on day two, you know, the firmament is called heaven. And so the pillars of heaven. So right there it tells you, okay, heaven also has pillars. We saw that the earth has pillars just uh, on page 20, 20. And then heaven also has pillars. And so which will also make more sense. And, uh, so when it says... The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. When you see God above in the highest heaven and at his rebuke, at his anger, at his wrath, we see the, if the pillars tremble and God is above it, so God obviously does something that shakes the heavens, that shakes the firmament, and the pillars tremble also because he is angry, he is wrath, he is wrath. And there's many places that, that uh, in, in the book and as even more in the Bible, that have this same, same idea, especially uh, in Revelation. And so the pillars can shake because God's above. You know, you can just pay. I, I know when my kid was young, we, well, he is young, but when he was younger, I know sometimes I'd stomp the floor to get his attention. Now, have any parents done that before? Okay. Do you think our father doesn't do the same thing? You know, so. <laughs> Hello down there. Well, yeah, well, yeah, and it's called heaven. The firmament is called, yeah, called heaven. And um, that, uh, you know, if the pillars shake, and, and we're going to get into more detail on that as well. So, page 28, uh, let's see, from ESV, for instance. Do you know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind, can you like him spread out the skies hard as a cast metal mirror. So that, you know, is another description of uh, firmament because also, if you go back again to page four, I reference page four a lot uh, because of the firmament, because some of these verses, God called the dome sky. So can you like him spread out the skies hard as a cast metal mirror? Um, the uh, NRSV, can you like him spread out the skies hard as a molten mirror? Or another one says, hard as a mirror of bronze, or which is strong and as, and as a molten looking glass. And I think most of us probably caught Rob's talk last night. And it's just, you know, um, it wouldn't surprise me if he already covered this verse in his talk. Well, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's another really interesting topic as well, you know. Um, so descriptions on page 29, God spread out the sky. It is described as being hard and strong and it is also described as being like a cast metal mirror. God, oh, I didn't keep going forward. So on, on verse 22, 
Out of the north comes golden splendor. God is clothed with awesome majesty. And so I, I picture northern lights when I read this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's. The rainbow. Yeah. The emerald rainbow. Yeah, yeah, and there's and there's descriptions where, like, say they have a vision of God above the uh, firmament and descriptions of things like exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Revelations, Revelation four. Yeah, Revelations four. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then I think what you talk about too with gold is the. Um, the New Jerusalem with the pure gold that was clear, you know, like if I remember it, it was talked about. Clear. So it's, how does that work? I don't know. It does. <laughs> God question. So uh, page 30. So this is what I referenced earlier. So where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So this is God basically really getting after Job. And uh, Job 38, there is so so much detail, so much information in Job 38. Uh, I recommend you guys check that out, and, and also 39 and 40. But so, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, which ties right back into page 20 of the book that we already covered. Tell me if, if, you, have any, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? So a lot of these, like I talked about, think of construction terms, is one of the first things you do in construction. You stake out where you're gonna do things, you know, you get the whatever's going to be under the foundation ready, and then you start measuring things out, staking things out. And these are construction terms. And who stretched the line upon it? You know, how are you going to stretch a line upon a ball? I mean, so, uh, and also, you know, like NIV, who stretched a measuring line across it? You know, across, if you look down below, from one side to the other, uh, the definition. Does everyone have a copy? I just want to make sure some other people walked in. Yeah, right up, right up front here, I got loaners for this. I was going to ask, what is that line that he's talking about? I, I think it's just a description of his, you know, the measurements, whatever measurements he went by. Um, I mean, I picture in, I, I like to think in simple terms. I just picture him having a tape measure going, do, 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 you know, measuring it. I don't see him actually doing that. That's just the image that I have. So I think we should not overcomplicate things. Not that you did. I just don't think we should overcomplicate all the little. What kind of line? What what did he use it out of? You know. So, um, but that's just how I picture just measuring things out. How am I going to do this? And where am I going to build this? Yeah, I, I don't think mankind could possibly know that. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's possible. We weren't, there. we weren't there. I don't think it's possible um, unless some of the angels that were there, because if you, this is kind of going off on a tangent, but, you know, if we keep reading where it says, on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone. So this is really interesting. On what were its bases sunk? So what are the foundations of the earth attached to? Basically, God's saying, you don't know this, so why are you, you know, being high and mighty against me? You know? so, so we don't know either. It's like a mystery. I have my theories on what the foundations of the earth are on, you know, but it's, it's just a total theory, and I don't even want to get into that because I don't have the answers for it. You know? That's but, the point of jokes. Yeah, I yeah, this. exactly. You have no idea. You have no idea you know? Exactly. Some revealed things are in the Bible and the hidden things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And... That's another one of those God questions. So it's interesting to think about, though, what for is sure. Theory, yeah, I, th I, if I had to guess, I'd say it has something to do with water. I'd say it has something to do with like a, a dense water of some sort. You know, you look at how does God, how did, and how did Jesus, and how did the angels? You know, the angel came down and had a foot on land and a foot on the water in Revelation. You know, God's chambers are on the water. It's in here, it talks about later. God's upper chambers are built on the water. Jesus walked on the water. You know, you and me and all of us, we'd go try to step in the water. And unless we're like Peter and have that immense amount of faith at that moment, we're going to all, you know, go under. But God doesn't operate like, like we do. I mean, and so that's just my theory. I'm totally open to being completely wrong on the subject. But what I was getting to with your question here... Um, and this is just a little bit off topic. I don't want to 
uh, to stray too far away. In verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Like I already discussed about the stars being around at this time when the foundation was being built, is the only way I could see that happening is if some of the stars wound up being fallen star, you know, like fallen angels that relayed that information to man would be the only possible way. And even then, I just don't give that much credibility to, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's like God, Jesus, and his, his kingdom, and you have, you know, all this fallen man kingdom that we contend with. Uh, it's like God playing basketball with a four-year-old. It's like, well, if we give in to what the four-year-old wants, then sure, we can be fearful, but... I don't know. It's, fast. it's interesting subject, so. Um, so page 32. So, the, heaven de the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So that's Werner von Braun's headstone uh, verse Rob talked about. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So this is the first description, at least in this book, about there being an end of the, end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and, like a strong man, runs its, its course with joy. Okay, and I know Rob covered this last night, so I don't want to beat it up too much, but you can see in the image on page 33, you know, about the sun and moon running its course from one end of the heavens and then also, you know, to the end of the world and the sun running its course and not earth running its course, you know, around the sun. Um, and also being a tent for the sun. I... You guys saw this, I'm sure, last night with Rob's talk, so I don't want to recover this. All right. So page 34, Psalm 74. So you split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. Okay, so it's confirming what we already knew um, from day four. Okay, verse 17. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. So just more descriptions of the earth, that there's a boundary of the earth. So uh, King James, thou hast set all the borders of the earth. So there's borders, there's boundaries. You fixed all the bounds of the earth. So there's somehow boundaries of the earth. And then, you know, we get a sense of the seasons as well. Um, so page 38 let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord that he looked down. Okay, that's another description. You know, up, down, ascend, descend. And how, how does that fit into, you know, what we're taught growing up? You know, down, up, doesn't exist on a spinning ball, you know, flying through a void. That's why we have to allegorize things like, even words like down. But if you read it for what it is and just keep things simple, it says down, from his holy height. So there, again, there's the word height. From heaven, the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners to set free those who were doomed to die. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. So yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just reaffirming what we already covered. And that's one thing with the book is I had to, the hardest part wasn't finding examples to use. The hardest part was how many redundant examples do I put in? Because there's so much. You know what I mean? I, I, I had, I think, a hundred and... There's 101 examples in the book, and I didn't even plan on having 101. But I look at this like a 101, what does the Bible say? Um, but I had 120-something, and I actually was like, it's, there's so many examples, and there's way more that I could have used, too. Um, but uh, I do think it's important to have that second witness and third witness and fourth witness and 20th witness, and it's saying the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. So on page 40, um, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You're, you are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with the garment. So, I mean, that, that's you could go into, you know, God making us in him an image, in his image, covering yourself with light, for instance. Um, stretching out the heavens like a tent. So here's another example. And I talked about this briefly yesterday about 
the firmament a lot of times is talked about being stretched. Not necessarily spread, it's talked about being stretched. And earth spread. So there's a, a lot of significant times where stretched, heavens are stretched, earth is spread. Um, just a side note there. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. So that's that example I talked about with, you know, the what God is able to do with water and how it interacts with him is very different than us, is what it seems like. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. Um, he set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. So could it be any more clear in this verse he set the earth on its foundations, so the foundations of the earth, so that it should never be moved. I mean, there's, we've already covered quite a few examples about earth not moving, set on foundations. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. So covering the earth, you know, describing uh, the flood. The waters stood above the mountains. Oh, that's it. The waters stood above the mountains. So. Um, just a simple descriptions, the beams on the waters above, you know, above the ferment, um, and how on day two, you know, the waters above, waters below, and how God walks on the vault also. We didn't, I didn't think we read that exact part yet, but it's coming up about walking on the vault. So page 42, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over, over all the earth. So picture that. You know, God is over all the earth. And so, you know, you can see over and all the earth. Whereas, you know, if you're, I hate to uh, beat a dead horse here, but if you're on the underside of a ball and God is supposedly up here, you know, uh, he's not above you at that point. Um, interesting. So, page 44. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise ye him all his hosts. Okay, let me stop there. When it talks about the heavenly hosts, stars, and angels, and in many areas, they seem to be interchangeable. And I have... Um, uh, not, not all the times, but they do seem to really, um, the heavenly host, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I cover that further in here. Praise ye him, sun and moon, praise him, all ye stars of light. So the stars praising him. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be, a, be above the heavens. Again, Rob mentioned this last night, but the waters above the, that are, and this is post-flood, waters being above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded it, and they were created. And does this seem just really simple, I guess, as far as these simple philosophies? I mean, it's not simple to understand. It's not simple for us to change and accept this. But does it seem simple, at least, that the descriptions are very consistent and very basic and very just, it's not complicated? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's the glasses. It's like yesterday when I covered that, we're brought up believing something else since before we could crawl. I kind of have a comment on that. Like, I, I remember, like, really, really early into my childhood, like, I have a it's sort of a, a gifted memory of that. But I can remember when I was two years old, you know, we come programmed from God, you know, like, with the right answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, well, how come, you know, like, that doesn't make any sense, you know, in, in saying yeah. these things, you know, like, asking my dad. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, well, it's like it's like the way a child thinks, you know, is actually in fact correct, which is yeah. And it's by His fact. grace, He He gave us that seed, you know, that we have that seed in us of questioning and knowing something's just not right. You know, I think most of us in this room, or if not all of us, have that have probably always had that something just doesn't taste right with what we're taught from the world. We don't know what it is necessarily all the time, but we have that in us, you know, and that's all God's doing for sure. So page 46, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. So this goes back to, there's a lot of back and forth you can do if you really want to 
uh, study that. So on page 26, on Job, Job 26, you know, it talks about he inscribed a circle on the face of the waters, okay? And this in Proverbs, when he established heavens, I was there, I was, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, okay? Like I said, this is starting to be redundant, right? But it's more and more confirmation. You know, it's more and more witnesses um, when he established the fountains of the deep. So at least in this book, this is the first mention of the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit, so there's a limit to the sea. We know there's a limit to earth. There's boundaries of the earth like we already covered. So that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Okay, so there's more talk about that more construction terms, I guess you could say, about marking out the foundations. What would you do in construction? You'd measure the line across it, mark out where your foundations are going to go, just simple, um, simple construction terms. And also, when it talks about, uh, like King James, for instance, uh, verse 27, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. And so I used to read that and go, you know, I like the outdoors. I was a Boy Scout. I had a compass in my backpack. I pictured something like that, like a magnetic north and all that. But that's not what it's talking about. This is the compass, <clears throat> excuse me, an instrument for drawing circles or marking measurements consisting of two pointed legs joined at the top by a pivot. You know, like a drafting compass. Um, so page 48. Uh, this one's interesting. So the sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. Okay, so you get a sense that it rises, it goes down, and it hastens to the place where it rises. So it returns. So the sun, um, and like we've already covered, goes from one end of the heaven to the other, one end of earth to the other. And when it talks about the sun rises, to me, what it's talking about is the perspective. When you're standing there, let's say you're standing there as a sun's, uh, you know, early in the morning and you're starting to see the sun. How does it appear to you? It you know, you're here and it's rising and it's going up and up and up and up and up. You know, come new time, you turn around, it goes, your perspective goes down, 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 down. It's, a, you know, it's describing that perspective. And some people get hung up on, we have all these consistencies throughout, but it says the sun rises. Well, it, it's from your perspective, you could say that it is uh, doing that. And it's also describing the sun and not, you know, the earth uh, spinning that way. So. I actually want to stop referencing the globe because I it just, you know, it's almost to the point where it's kind of uh, silly. But so the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. On its circuit, the wind returns. So we start seeing descriptions of certain things God made that are on circuits. That are um, the sun and moon and stars are on their circuits. The the wind, we're going to learn later, the water has its courses also, and, and that it has its uh, routes that the water takes. Um, let's see. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the stream flows, there they flow again. You know, and so, you know, at the bottom of page 49, you can see the, you know, the, the route the water's taken. Uh, it's just pretty incredible, this, this I don't want to say self-sustaining, because it's God's sustaining system that he made. But when you picture it just in simple terms, this, this. Like a terrarium. Yeah, it's just, it's just an amazing, absolutely incredible creation that he made. So Isaiah 40, 22, along with that verse in Job, this is the one of the two verses that all of us, well, I shouldn't say all of us, that I certainly grew up saying, you know, hey, yes, of course the, the Bible says we're on a spinning ball in space. This is one of the two I would use, and I would hope they wouldn't ask for more, because I had nothing else. Okay, so King James here, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Okay, allegory, right? <laughs> and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. I know Rob covered this last night, but that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So, and this is just that circle of the earth again, which we've already covered twice already uh, in this. So, page 52. Um, so these are two examples that cover the same thing. So both in Isaiah. So uh, verse 5 from uh, ESV. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. So again, like I mentioned earlier, 
it's pretty darn consistent where it talks about uh, the heavens stretched, earth spread. Heavens stretched, earth spread, like I mentioned um, in uh, earlier. So, all right, so page 54, NRSV. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first and I am the last. My hand laid the foundation of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon, they stand at attention. I cover this at the end of the book as far as, well, hang on a second, didn't God speak? and it was created, or did his right hand do it? And I cover this at the end, it's both. You know, who is God's right hand? Uh huh. And everything was created through him. And so it's a little insight. We see a little, oh, that's a contradiction. He says, you spoke it, you spoke, you commanded it, and it happened. But here it says your right hand did it. It's both. Page 56. Anybody, oh, we're out of copies, but... Uh, Okay, good, yeah. Share if you would, if somebody else doesn't have one. So, and, and one thing too is, I'm kind of just randomly picking which version to use because it's not just one version saying any one thing. And when I originally made the book, I wanted to have six to eight versions in here. Just because it's not like, it's, oh, it's only this one version that describes something different. It's, no, it's, it's all of them that I've seen just consistently describe the, in basic terms, the same thing. And so I'm not like picking any one, I, I tend to kind of like the, the wording of the ESV, I guess, but it's not any one other than the other, you know? If I could only have one, I'd say, I, I'd take the King James, um, if I could only have one, I'm not a King James only person, but um, I kind of, I like the simplicity of reading, you know, say the ESV for instance, but I personally love parallel Bibles. I like to, what does this verse say from this? What is this? What is this? And uh, compare them. So. This kind yeah. of reminds me of those little toys you see that when you're little, you shake them. Yeah, loose. snow globe. Snow globe. Yeah. Yep. You know what's it's interesting? Like, if you guys watch this in movies, see how many times the globe and a snow globe are in movies and especially kids shows. Yeah. It's all the time, and it's I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but it's interesting to see. Yeah. Yep. Examples of that. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah yeah. So the B movie, there's a Minions movie at the very end of Minions 2, if I remember right, uh, where he get one of the, Kevin gets his toy and it's a snow globe. Oh, that's off the top of my head. Um, oh, come on, come on, there's so many of them. In the beginning of Bruce Almighty, the, the, the very beginning credits, whoever the company is that made it, they show this nice mountain scene as they zoom out, you're in a snow globe that's like, looks exactly like this. The image is in here. So they're telling us. It's like in your face. It's in your face. And, yeah. yeah. It's all in your face. Movie. Oh, yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. 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 You put me on the spot, but there's, there's quite a few more, and I, I forget all of them. Page 56, Jeremiah 10. So, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes. So, earlier we covered that, you know, God stomping or however he does it on the ferment will transfer down, down the firmament, the pillars of the heavens shake, as we already covered, and then which causes earth to shake because it's connected. The foundations of the earth are, the foundations of heaven are on the earth. So that's why, uh, especially in Revelation, when we have the massive earthquakes coming, you know, it makes sense because it's all connected. Let's see, thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens, just more descriptions. It is he who made the earth by his power, he who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Again, the term stretched for the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens. So, when he utters, so you, just another reference to the waters in the heavens. Um, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth, which we already covered. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. And that, so this is an interesting term, the storehouses for the wind. I don't get into that subject in the book, but it's an interesting uh, subject. So page 58, so let's do uh, NLT, the, the bottom ones. Um, so in all the examples, I use those same four uh, versions, but sometimes I include the New Living Translation just because it has a, for the wording, I guess, of it. But 
I also include. So this is what the Lord says, just as the heavens cannot be measured. This was your question earlier. Remember? Yeah, this was your question earlier. Just as the heavens cannot be measured and the foundations of the earth cannot be explored, so I will not consider casting them away for the evil they have done. I, the Lord, have spoken. So the heavens cannot be measured. The foundations of the earth cannot be explored. Yeah, well, well so it's, so later on in the book, we, there's version, I don't know if we'll get to it, but about um, at God's rebuke and at God, when he's flying on, a, if I remember at this one, he's flying on his cherub and at the breath of his nostrils, all the, you, the foundations are exposed, right? So he was able to expose them, you know, doing what he did, but we can't go out searching for them and look at the foundations of the earth. Like, you know, we've only drilled down roughly eight miles as the deepest man has ever gone. We are not, uh, we're arrogant enough to think that we could, but we're not, we're not possible. It's not possible to do that. So Amos 9, 6, I know Rob covered this last night, it is he that buildeth his stories in the heavens and hath founded his troop in the earth. And so let's read that from a different uh, uh, version too. So, because Rob covered that troop in the earth. So he builds his lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth. So this is another example of the heavens having a foundation that is set on the earth. Who builds his upper chambers in the heavens, like we already covered because those chambers were set on water, and founds his vault upon the earth. Okay. Um, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. Again. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power, this is ESV, toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule. And this is just to, just to show that same, the same descriptions, the same consistent above, you know, over, you know, just that up-down descriptions are, I mean, there are thousands of descriptions of up-down I mean, thousands. That's just kind of one thing I wanted to emphasize. And I know it's very simple, but it's something that we tend to overlook. So page 62. For we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against, upon, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, and this really reminds me of, you know, what are we told about black holes? And we see black holes are something that like sucks in light or whatever, you know, and yeah. And so, well, when you read in uh, John chapter one, talking about, you know, the light and the dark and the darkness didn't comprehend the light. And so if, you, if we kind of picture that and we can, if supposedly we can have telescopes and see, well, there's something that is like super, super black or whatever, well, that goes right into the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places if light and dark are complete exact opposites, if that kind of makes sense. Just kind of a side note that uh, I find kind of interesting. Page 64, James 1. So every generation, er, excuse me, every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. I, so I put NLT in here for a reason. Let's see. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God and our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. Okay. There's nothing earth shattering that we haven't already covered here, but it's just more uh, confirmation about above and descending, ascending. Well, good. Part, we're on, here's part three. So clues about earth and biblical stories.